in the beginning of the year, um, every year for my class, I don't use the textbook, and that's a, a big deal at my school. I, um, sixth grade, they've had the textbook at the beginning, it, first week for every year before they got to me, and then suddenly they're in sixth grade, their parents are expecting the textbook the first day of school. And I don't let them touch the textbook for a couple of weeks, and we play games, and we do things where they have to listen to each other. They can't solve the puzzle on their own kind of thing. They have to work together, and it forces them to ask questions and, um, and uh, respect one another to be able to, to, to um, solve a puzzle or whatever it is that, that we're working on that day. Just letting go of that textbook. Well, I, I know um, I'm in my classroom, um, a lot of culture building at the beginning of the year, too, where you learn to talk to each other and listen to each other. Um, but I teach middle school, so it's um, it's easy for them to get to talk to each other. But when it's in, or they're in front of class, they're less, they're more hesitant to um, to actually raise their hand and ask questions or, or volunteer and answer. Um, so I, we do a lot of think pair shares, and I found that to be a really amazing thing. So like if I only get one student with their hand up, like I'll tell them, oh, I only have one student with their hand up. I need more hands. Go talk to your partner. So even just stopping, just stopping the lesson saying talk to your partner, or I keep giving the same hand up, talk to your partner. And I do that a lot, and I find that walking around while they're talking to their partner, I get a lot more in terms of what their misconceptions are than if I just get the one or two students with their hands up. So I think think pair shares, which um, are very easy to implement, um, have been really useful in my own classroom, um, and I love using them. So. I think, um, <coughs> oh, I lost my thought, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I did this last time, too. <laughs> uh, I would like to agree with what Antoinette said uh, with regard to think, pair, share. I think it's a really great strategy for uh, ensuring that all of your learners in your class are really talking math and really getting on that same page. Um, and I'd also like to agree with both Cecilia and Oh, I'm sorry, Hillary. Hillary and Antoinette, that at the uh, beginning of the year, it, you do as much uh, culture building in your class as you can. Um, one of the things that I feel uh, helps build culture in the, in the math classroom, a culture around discourse, is embracing misconceptions and really highlighting how much you can learn from a misconception. And uh, oftentimes, I will spend more time on a misconception or exploring how did somebody or how could somebody have come up with their misconception and exploring the mathematics behind how they were thinking. Because often misconceptions really are mathematical reasoning and there's just something about a story that has gone astray that they just didn't pay attention to a little detail or... Um, so it's often not very wrong, the mathematical thinking that's there. It's just incorrect in the situation of a problem. So definitely think Pierre Scherer is something that we use, um, shoulder partners. Um, making sure we have our, our teams and, and giving the kids the freedom to work within their teams, within parameters and guidelines. Um, but also, like has been stated already, just taking time at the beginning of the year to have conversations. Uh, the very second day of school after we went through all the syllabus stuff on the first day, we talked about order of operations. And I, I wanted the kids to share with them, with each other and with, and with me, how do they remember order of operations? And what I wanted to get at was that this is a memory, uh, many of them rely on a memory trick of using PEMDAS, but they really have not gone deep enough to truly understand it. And so from the very, very second day of school, we had um, the statement up on the board, um, how, did PEMDAS mislead you or how is PEMDAS misleading you? And so then it set up the, um, the framework for us to continue to revisit that idea of, have you been taught a memory trick or are you relying on a memory trick that is simply just a memory trick that's not working for you? And so have you been misled? And if you've been misled, then how do we um, lead you to the correct place or, or, or to another way of thinking that will work for you? Because it seems like kids are often taught memory tricks to remember mathematics, but they don't understand the mathematics. So the memory trick is just this other th entity that exists, but they don't understand it. And so that's another misconception or another area is to go and make the, the connection and the bridge between the mathematics behind the shortcuts and the tricks and the memory devices that we use to help kids. So much of, of what you were just talking about too reminds me, Cecilia, of 
uh, how important the tasks are that we do with our kids versus um, well, just how, how we choose, or, I'm sorry, how important the tasks are that um, if they're deep enough, then we can go there. Uh, if they're not deep tasks, then we're not going to get there with our kids. And also how, um, how much discourse is going to come out of a deep task and how passionate we feel about something when there is that disequilibrium. So if you and I see something very differently, um, we're more apt to argue about it. We're more apt to really dig deep and try to understand each other. Um, or just proof that we're right. <laughs> <laughs>